This presentation is part of a lecture series on multi-resolution signal and geometry processing by Michael Adams at the University of Victoria in Victoria, Canada. For those of you who might be interested, a copy of the slides for this lecture series, as well as the corresponding textbook, can be downloaded from the website whose URL is given on this slide, in particular this URL here. So in the next few slides, we're going to look at the OpenGL Utility Toolkit, or GLUT as it's better known, in more detail. Because OpenGL only performs rendering and it doesn't support window management functionality or I.O., for example, using keyboards and mice and so on, when OpenGL is used, typically some other helper library has to be used along with it to provide window management functionality, I.O. functionality, and so on. And the particular helper library that I'm going to discuss in this presentation is the OpenGL Utility Toolkit, or GLUT as it's better known. So GLUT is basically a simple windowing API for use with OpenGL, and it's intended to be used with small to medium-sized OpenGL programs. So if you're writing a really complicated graphics application, you probably wouldn't want to use GLUT because it's very simple. It's good for doing simple things, but if you want to do more complicated things, it doesn't provide a lot of a lot of uh, very rich functionality. The language binding for GLUT is C, so it's a C library. It's Windows system independent, and it supports most mainstream operating systems, including Windows, Microsoft Windows-based operating systems, as well as Linux and Unix-based operating systems like Mac OS X, for example. It provides window management functionality, so you can create and destroy windows, display windows, resize windows, query and set attributes of windows. It also allows for user input via devices like keyboards, mice, trackballs, and various other devices as well. It has routines for drawing common wireframe and solid 3D objects such as sphere, spheres, toruses, and also the well-known teapot model. And the basic structure of GLUT, the, the way things work, is that an application program registers callback functions to handle various types of events for example, to display the actual graphics for the application or to resize the window or to process keyboard input and so on. And then it loops processing events. And there's an open source implementation of GLUT called FreeGLUT that's available from the URL shown at the bottom of the slide here. The GLUT library is based on what's called an event-driven programming model. And in an event-driven model, the flow of the program is determined by events where an event might correspond to a mouse button being pressed or released, or a key being pressed or released, or a window being resized, and, and things like this. And an application that's making use of an event-driven model, it will perform some initialization when it starts up, and then it enters an event processing loop for the duration of its execution. And each iteration of this event processing loop simply waits for an event to occur, and when an event does occur, it processes the event and then goes back up to the top of the loop, it waits for an event, when an event occurs it processes the event. And this is, the whole program has this structure, it just sits in a loop waiting for an event to occur, and then when it does occur it processes the event. And many libraries for building graphical user interfaces employ event-driven programming models, and not surprisingly GLUT uses such a model. A GLUT application program has the general structure shown on this slide, so the very first thing that the application does is initialize the GLUT library by calling the function GLUT init. And GLUT init always has to be the very first function in the GLUT library that's invoked by the application because this is the function that initializes the library and using any other functionality in the library before the library is initialized will result in unknown or undefined behavior. The next thing that an application will do is set the display mode and this selects, for example, whether or not the drawing that's done is going to be done in grayscale, or whether it's going to be done in color, or whether it's going to be done with color plus alpha information, in other words, transparency information. This also controls double buffering, depth buffering, and some other things as well. Then the application will perform any other additional initialization that's required, and typically this involves creation of windows. There'll be at least one graphics window that will need to be created, in some applications more than one. The application will register any callback functions for handling various types of events, for example maybe to handle keyboard events when a key is pressed on the keyboard or mouse events and so on. Then some additional setup of OpenGL state might be required, for example to enable depth buffering or shading or lighting calculations or setting the clear color which is the 
color that windows are cleared to when they're cleared. And then lastly, the application will call the glut main loop function, which enters the main event processing loop inside the glut library. And the function glut main loop never returns. Basically, it goes into an infinite loop waiting for an event to occur, one of the events that the application program is interested in, for example, a, a keyboard event with, with a key being pressed. It waits until the event occurs, then it will wake up. It will call the callback function that the application program has registered to handle that event, and then it goes back to sleep waiting for another event. And this loop just goes on forever. For this reason, if an application wants to exit, the only way they can do this is by calling the exit function. Both the GLUT library and the OpenGL library place their header files in a directory called GL in uppercase letters. In order to use the GLUT library, it's necessary just to include a header file called GLUT.h, which is in the GL subdirectory. So this is the header file that needs to be included. And this header file also includes the necessary OpenGL header files as well. So if you include GLUT.h, you probably don't need to include any header files for OpenGL. On this slide and the next is a summary of the event types supported by GLUT. The event types that tend to be more frequently used are highlighted in magenta on both of these slides. So starting with the first event type that's listed, a display event indicates that an application needs to draw the contents of a window. And any application that needs to produce graphics output must process display events because essentially this is the only way that output gets drawn. An overlay display event is similar to a display event except that it pertains to an overlay plane. A reshape event notifies the application of a change in the size of a window or its initial size. And an application can use this type of event in order to adjust its graphics output to match a particular window size. A keyboard event notifies the application that a key has been pressed. A mouse event indicates that a mouse button has either been pressed or released. A motion event signals that the mouse has moved within a window while one or more mouse buttons are pressed. A passive motion event signals that the mouse has moved within a window while no mouse buttons are pressed. A visibility event indicates that the visibility of a window has changed. In other words, the window was previously covered and has now become uncovered or vice versa. An entry event signals that the mouse has left or entered a window. And lastly, a special keyboard event signals that a special key on the keyboard has been pressed, such as an arrow key or a function key. In addition to a keyboard and mouse, some systems may have other more exotic input devices, such as a space ball, a button box, dials, or a drawing tablet. The first several event types on this slide relate to these types of input devices. Spaceball motion and spaceball rotate events signal that the spaceball has undergone a translation and rotation respectively. A spaceball button event indicates that a spaceball button has been pressed or released. A button box event indicates that button box activity has occurred. A dials event signals that dial activity has occurred. A tablet motion event indicates that the tablet has experienced pen motion. A tablet button event indicates that a tablet button has been pressed or released. Lastly, we have a few other miscellaneous event types. A menu status event indicates that the status of a glut menu has changed. In other words, a pop-up menu has just opened or just closed. An idle event indicates that no other events are currently awaiting processing. And the idle event can be used by an application to do work when no other events are pending. A timer event signals that a timer has expired and such an event might be used by an application to ensure that some task is performed at a particular time. This is often used in order to ensure that an application updates the graphics output at a particular frame rate. And in this context, the timer event could be used to signal the time at which the next frame must be drawn. On this slide and the next few slides, we have a brief summary of some of the functions in the GLUT library. To begin with, we have some functions for initialization. The glut init function was mentioned earlier, and this is the function that's used to initialize the library, the glut library, and this function has to be called before any other function in the library. Then we have glut init window size. This is used to specify the nominal size of new windows that are created by the glut create window function. This is only the nominal size for windows. In other words, this size is only a request saying it would be nice if you could make the windows have this size, but it doesn't have to be honored by the system. 
Then we have the function glut init window position, and this specifies the nominal window position for a window that's created by glut create window. Again, this is only at the nominal position of the window. In other words, it's just a request. It doesn't have to be adhered to by the system. Then we have glut init display mode. This is used to set the initial display mode used by the library. This sets up things like whether you're using monochrome or color, or whether you're using double buffering or not, or whether you're using Z buffering or not and so on. Then we have the function glut main loop which enters the glut event processing loop as described in an earlier slide. The glut library has a number of window management functions some of which are listed here. There is the glut create window which is used to create a top level window in other words a window that's actually associated with some physical window on the screen. Glut create subwindow, which creates a subwindow. A subwindow is a subregion on an already existing window. Glut set window sets the current window. Glut get window gets the current window. Glut destroy window destroys the specified window. Glut post redisplay, it marks the current window as needing to be redisplayed. In other words, it forces a display event to be generated for the current window. This provides a mechanism whereby an application can force a window to be redrawn. Glut swap buffers swaps the buffers associated with the current window if double buffering is enabled. Now double buffering is a, is a, is a approach where two full copies of the screen are kept. One that are being drawn into and one of them which is currently being displayed and seen by the user. And the idea is all of the drawing is done into the copy that the user can't see then when the drawing is done, the two copies of the screen are swapped and the one that was previously being drawn into becomes the one that the user sees and the one that the user sees becomes the one that's being drawn into. And this is done in order to improve the fluidity in which um, the screen updates are done. Basically, screen updates become or appear instantaneous when uh, double buffering is used. Glut position window requests a change to the position of the current window. And again, this is just a request. It can be ignored or not honored. Glut reshape window requests a change to the size of the current window. And again, this is just a request. It may actually be ignored or not honored. Glut full screen, which requests the current window be made full screen, another, so that it take, occupies the full size of the screen. Glut set window title sets the title for the current top level window. Usually this appears in the title bar of the window, although this depends on the particular operating system and window manager that's being used. Glut set icon title sets the title of the icon for the current top level window. And glut set cursor sets the cursor image for the current window. In other words, you can change the shape of the cursor. Maybe it's an arrow or maybe it's some other symbol. The glut library has several functions for menu management as listed on this slide. Using these functions, it is possible to create and destroy menus, add and remove items from menus, and so on. For each type of event supported by the GLUT library, a function is provided for registering a callback function to handle that type of event. This slide lists the callback registration functions for some of the more commonly used event types. For example, the function GLUT display func is used to set the display callback function for the current window. In other words, this establishes the function that would be called for the current window when a display event is generated for that window. The GLUT library provides several functions for querying a variety of state information. The function GLUT get retrieves some simple GLUT state information. For example, it can be used to query the size or position of the current window and quite a few other things as well. Glut device get can be used to retrieve information about what devices are available. For example, is there a keyboard on the system? Is there a mouse, a space ball, a tablet, and so on? The function glut get modifiers can be used to retrieve information about the modifier key state uh, when certain callback functions are invoked. Uh, by modifier keys, these are keys like the shift key, the control key, the alt key and sometimes the application may want to query the state of these keys because, for example, inside the callback for, for the mouse function, if someone clicks a mouse button, presses a mouse button down, for example, the meaning of the, the mouse button being pressed may change depending on whether the control key is also simultaneously being pressed or the shift key or the alt key and so on. So glut get modifiers provides the application access to 
the state of these other keys. Several functions are also provided for rendering bitmap and stroke fonts in the library. Bitmap fonts, bitmap fonts describe characters as pixel patterns, while stroke fonts describe characters in terms of line segments, which makes stroke fonts more amenable to scaling. The first two functions that are listed here, glut bitmap character and glut bitmap width, pertain to bitmap fonts. The function glut bitmap character is used to actually draw a character using a bitmap font. And the function glut bitmap width is used to find out how much space the character is going to take when it's drawn, what the width of the character is. Uh, glut stroke character and glut stroke width are used to are used in conjunction with stroke fonts, and glut stroke character actually draws a stroke character or a character in a stroke font, and glut stroke width queries the width of a stroke character. In other words, tells you what the width of the character would be when it's rendered. The GLUT library also provides functions for rendering a variety of geometric objects as either a wireframe or a solid. Some of these functions are listed on this slide. The shapes that are supported by these functions include a sphere, cube, cone, torus, octahedron, tetrahedron, and the classic teapot model. For example, the function GLUT solid sphere can be used to render a solid sphere, whereas the function GLUT wire sphere can be used to render a wireframe of a sphere and so on with the remaining functions that are listed here. At this point we're going to consider a very minimalist GLUT program and all this program does is it creates a window and clears the window to a particular color so it will generate output similar to what's shown on this slide. On this slide we have the source code for our minimalist GLUT program and if we look at the main function, the very first thing we do inside the main function is we call the function glut init, which initializes the glut library. Again, the very first function that's called in the glut library always has to be glut init, because until the library is initialized, it's invalid to call any other function in the library. Once we've initialized the library, then we call glut init display mode. And this is used, for example, to establish double buffering. So this is saying that we'd like to use windows that support double buffering and we'd like to use windows that support RGB color. So we're going to be drawing things in color. Then we call glut init, glut init window size to specify that the nominal size of any windows that we create should be 512 pixels wide by 512 pixels high. Again, this is just a suggestion to the system. It's not required that it actually give us a window of this size. It's just indicating that it would be nice if it could give us a window of this size. But it would be a mistake to assume that we will always be given a window of this size. We then call the glut create window function to actually create a window. And the parameter that's passed here is just a, a string which indicates a title which can be placed at the top of the window. Or wherever it is that the operating system and window manager actually place titles. Then we call the glut display func function to register a callback function for display events. This is the function called display which appears up above on line 6 and this is a function that will actually draw something. It's the function that actually does rendering into a window. And then we call the glut main loop function to to handle events and this function will never return. So what's going to happen once glut main loop is called at some later point in time the window that was created on line 16 is going to be is going to be actually coming into existence and when it does the very first thing that's going to happen is a display event will be generated for the window because we have to actually display what is supposed to appear in the window. So this is going to call our callback function for the display event which is this function called display and the very first thing it does is called GL clear color. We haven't discussed this function. This is actually part of the OpenGL library. And what it does is it clears the contents of the window to the color that's specified by the RGBA values here. This is the amount of red in the, 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 uh, in the color, the amount of green, the amount of blue, and then alpha, which we're not actually using in this example. So its value doesn't really matter. It's for transparency information. Then we call GL clear to actually clear the window and we specify that we want to clear out the color information as well as the depth buffer. It's always important to clear the depth buffer, otherwise you may end up with some things not being drawn. 
And then we call glups glut swap buffers to actually cause the buffer that we're drawing into to become visible to the user. And that's basically the whole example. On this slide I've listed a few references on glut. Reference number one is the actual specification of the library. So this is a very detailed description of the library which is very useful when writing code using the glut library. Reference number two is a good reference on OpenGL but it also includes some information on the GLUT library as well. Uh, reference number three is the home page for the GLUT library, which has some useful information. And lastly, the GLUT manual in HTML format, which is maybe easier to navigate than a PDF version of the document, which is given by the URL for reference number four.